And talked it this morning briefly about tuberculosis and how it relates to our practice in orthopedics. Um, I haven't seen any cases of TB here, but I know when I was in Perth last year, we saw a lot of it, particularly in the Aboriginal population and in the refugee population. Um, it was a real problem over there, trying to you know, sort out what drugs to put these people on, how to manage them, and more importantly, how to follow them up often, because they're a very unreliable patient group. So in terms of the epidemiology of TB, it's a huge problem worldwide. Um, the WHO puts out this uh, report every couple of years, based um, on findings they have in the field. Um, it's estimated to affect over 1.9 billion people directly, and then the 3 million deaths per year. Three quarters of those are in sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia. In industrialised nations and the Western world, um, the incre incidence increased in the 80s and early 90s, and this is particularly so with extra pulmonary disease in immigrants, Aboriginal transplant patients, uh, drug addicts, and the AIDS and HIV positive population, where it's commonly seen in patients with low CD4 counts. Um, and up to 10% of TB patients develop musculoskeletal infections, and 50% uh, of musculoskeletal involvement is within the spinal uh, column, the thoracic spine being the most common site. Uh, this is taken from the uh, report just shown. Um, so this is the incident rates, incidence rates in 2011. There's the most current uh, data trends. So in Australia, we're relatively spared, but in the remainder of the world, particularly in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, India, there are very, very high prevalence rates. And so we just have to be very uh, cautious when we're dealing with people that have come from these countries, particularly um, with respect to, say, the increasing people. It's not so much of an issue um, at, at the moment with respect to uh, native, uh, I guess, Australian-born people, but given the amount of refugees we see, especially in clinic from sort of Sudan, Somalia, Ethiopia, these places are sort of complex histories. So the gunshot guy we got the other day from Ethiopia had been riddled with 15 bullets or something. You know, you've always got to keep in your back of your mind. You know, um, TB could be, could be uh, in this manner. If it's not active, it could well and truly be dormant. Um, and then again, uh, HIV prevalence in TB. So this is another big one to be aware of. Again, in Central America and also in South America and Africa. And it's up to 50% of people who have HIV can commonly have a TB infection. And also closer to home, you see the um, PNG talking as a source. Not that we see that many patients from it, but it is really right on our doorstep. <coughs> Um, more concerningly, these figures I'm just going to show, these are the multi-drug resistant forms of TB. So these are the prevalence rates. Whilst it, it doesn't really affect a lot of the patients that come to us directly from sort of sub-Saharan Africa, um, and it's more in the sort of former Yugoslavian population, those I'm trying to find out where the primary source of these multi-drug resistant organisms. It uh, may well be due to the fact there's only limited evidence unlimited data that's collected on it uh, for whatever reason. But I think this trend, you know, towards increasing drug resistance is going to be a real problem with TB in that overseas obviously the access to medications without prescription is far greater and the access to you know far more potent antibiotics without any real supervision of uh, care and administration is a real concern. Um, what this slide shows is probably the most concerning thing. This is TB that's resistant to basically everything. So this is what they call XDR-TB. So this is multi-drug resistant TB. Um, and it's basically a worldwide problem. Um, this is resistant, resistant to everything we've got so far. And uh, the case didn't state where the case is uh, reporting Australia come from, but I'd be dubious to whether or not they're actually homegrown cases. I think they're more far more likely to be in the uh, migrant or refugee population. So just going through the microbiology of TB, uh, it was discovered by Robert Koch in 1882, which he uh, received the Nobel Prize. Um, 
It's a type of mycobacteria, of which there's over 100 recognised species. Um, other types are Mycobacterium leprae and Mycobacterium bovis. There are seven main types which infect humans. They're a type of acid fast bacilli, so they're not, not, seen on, not seen on regular gram staining. You have to stain them with uh, specific uh, stains in order, in order to delineate their waxy cell wall. And um, particularly the one is talked about as a ZN stain or Zeal Nielsen stain. They're obligate aerobes and they produce no toxins or enzymes. They have a low uh, growth rate and they divide every 15 to 20 hours compared to things like E. coli, which have a much more rapid uh, rate of duplication. And then you have to culture them long term in Lawrence and Johnson medium. And similarly, in relation to the previous uh, slides, we've shown there's a significant geographical diversity in the, in the substrains of uh, TB. So the pathogenesis of infection, uh, you have sensitization which occurs up to two weeks after inoculation. And it's a delayed cell mediated and hypersensitive reaction rather than acute sort of pyogenic reaction. Uh, and in that period of time, you get, after, after you've been sensitized, then you have a positive tuberculin skin test and you're sensitized for life. Uh, the TB organism actually evokes a granular, granulomatous reaction, uh, which is a non-specific granulomatous reaction. They get phagocytosed by macrophages and then um, T cells become sensitized and induce further macrophage action. They're dubbed as being, the granulomas themselves are dubbed as being cold abscesses in that they don't form pus and um, they typically um, you know, are chronic in nature. They have four components of the epithelioid cells, the Langhouse giant cells, they have rimming fibroblasts, and then a, c a central core of caseous necrosis, which is a combination of, sort of liquefactive and coagulative um, necrosis. So the primary infection is uh, typically via the lung in most cases, however, it can be passed uh, through the gut in terms of breast milk, and also in the, via, the skin, via skin contact, which is rarer. Um, the primary complex is the infection unsensitized patient. It typically is a lesion in the upper region of the lower lung and it spreads to regional lymph nodes. And then um, this, this lesion is called a GON complex. There is usually no or minimal clinical illness at this point. And um, the real concerning part of this is that it uh, progresses onto uh, chronic TB. The, this is due to you know, hematodrocine seeding or miliary TB, uh, the reservoir of bacilli in the nodes, and then it can be reactivated later on. So secondary infection is infection of previously sensitized patient, typically reactivation of a, of a prior disease, or can be due to uh, reinfection at a secondary, uh, after a secondary exposure. It's usually in the apical region of the lung, secondary to uh, a high oxygen content of the area. This is where it's called a Simon's focus, which you can see there in those uh, in that picture there with a the, the round lesion in the lower part of the upper lobe. Then later on, um, you can get uh, tertiary lesions, which are extra pulmonary lesions and typically multiple, and they can affect any organ. And this is where um, skeletal TB comes in. So the clinical features of an acute uh, Tuberculosis infection is generally very vague. Um, uh, chronic uh, constitutional symptoms of malaise, uh, fevers, feeling uneasy, weight loss, night sweats, back pain, and then more specifically with orthopedic uh, presentations, things such as limping and joint pain, and back pain. So it's like, uh, it is one of the differentials for those sort of problems. And on your phys phys physical examination, often you won't find anything. Um, you may find some subtle joint swelling, you may find sinuses, deformity, and neurological deficits. Uh, but these are really only after chronic uh, infections. So this, this is just outlining the symptoms of TB. But pretty much, depending on where it infects, uh, affects the lung primarily, then after that, it can really go anywhere. And from that, from where it uh, ends up, is realistically where the symptoms are going to arise. But as we know, 50% of people. Uh, with skeletal involvement, get TB in their spine, so back pain is the big one we have to watch out for. Um, in terms of uh, orthopedic manifestations, so it rarely originates primarily in a long bone, but it can. 
uh, metaphyseal foci can occur in children. It may originate in the epiphysis and then spread into the adjacent joint uh, and can cross the physis. Uh, dactylitis can occur. We have, you can see the picture down like this down the bottom. Uh, we have diffuse lytic areas of the phalanges and metacarpals and uh, reactive periostitis. In terms of joint infection, uh, there are two, two different ways it can seed to the joint, so either by direct uh, spread from a bony abscess or uh, hematogenous seeding when it's disseminating via the bloodstream. The synovium becomes thick and dermatous, and marked effusion, you have rice bodies, tannus of granu invasive granulation tissue, and then over time you actually get uh, ankylosis of the joint. To examination, realistically, there's not a whole lot you're going to see. Uh, you may see an effusion, it may feel a bit thick and warm, and you may see late changes, you know, thick flexion deformities, contractures, and enclosed joints. The primary uh, manifestation in orthopedics we have to worry about is spinal TB. It's the second most common site of TB outside the lung. Typically, in developing countries, 40% of people are affected are less than 16 years old. This is really a pediatric orthopedic problem in, in, in the third world. Um, early infection is spread via the arteries, not via um, Batson's plexus, to the anterior inferior body. Um, you can see here this diagram which shows all the different areas it can affect, but it's like you point to everywhere. But it, um, these are the regions here, the anterior inferior body, that they talk about most commonly. It spreads on the anterior longitudinal ligament through the end plate and via the disc. Uh, multiple levels can be involved, skip lesions can be involved, and paraspinal abscess formation up to 50%. Um, initially, it does not involve the disc, but it travels by the arterial su supply of the vertebral body, which is an interesting distinguishing feature from hygienic osteomyelitis. Um, and then you have changes associated with uh, chronic infection, being kyphosis, sinus formation, POTS paraplegia and then other sorts of spinal cord injury. Um, acute spinal cord injury is rare, uh, can be due to abscess formation and pathological fractures. Um, however, more chronic infections are associated more highly with spinal cord in injury and POTS disease, where you have bony sequestra or um, chronic inflammation around the spinal cord, which leads to scarring and a permanent neurological deficit. So the natural history of TV is it may resolve completely, it may heal with residual deformity and loss of function. You can get abscesses and um, granulomas, which can form and just lay quiescent. You can have a persistent low-grade grumbling infection for many years. Uh, you can have local spread, distant spread, reactivation, which is often what we'll be uh, coming in contact with, which will be uh, two to five percent of all cases that become reactive at 20 years. Uh, factors which are involved with that are corticosteroid use, immunosuppression, age, and malnutrition. Under immunosuppression, uh, if they're aware of uh, HIV patients, this is where people who may have had TB in the past then contract AB, um, HIV and it reactivates. Um, and the mortality uh, associated with TB prior to treatment was approximately 30% in those with osteoarticular disease, so be aware of this in patients who are coming from overseas. Differential diagnosis for uh, TB, if you are considering it. Um, Room to a seronegative arthropathies, uh, tumours, and then other types of granulomatous infections. So some of those are listed there. The typical other atypical bacteria, fungi and spirochetes can all be uh, masquerading as TB as well. But it should always be on our radar when we're not sure what's going on as a potentially infected region. Uh, in terms of investigations, the white cell count's often normal. ESR uh, is usually elevated, but it may be normal in up to about 25% of cases. The PPD test is positive in only about 80%. Uh, there's a newer test called a quantifying gold assay, which is an immunoassay, which is uh, 90, over 99% sensitive and about 92%, sorry, 99 specific and 92% sensitive. That's a blood test that's done for it, which um, shows there's been any exposure in the past. And this is the gold standard investigation at present. Um, Diagnosis actually on, on tissue is uh, via ZN stain and micro microscopy. However, uh, this is really not very sensitive at all. It takes uh, positive overall in about 30%. In bony specimens, it's between 60 and 80%. Uh, it takes a very long time to grow in culture. And 
other ways of testing for sputum, and then uh, and then uh, joint aspiration. However, joint aspiration is often negative. Um, the advent of PCRs allowed for faster identification, but uh, again, you have to have representative samples of tissue to actually get that assay to be positive. Correct. Correct. Negative in BCG is that it's positive if you've actually got TB or had exposure to TB in the past. So these days, in terms of screening for it, if you go to say an immunology clinic where you test positive with a uh, MAN2 test, then they will test your blood using a quantity on gold assay. And that's commonly what's used in immunosuppressed populations, used such as HIV, etc. We'll see. Uh, in terms of orthopedic investigations, there are really very few uh, specific features that are going to distinguish uh, spiculosis. Osteopenia, some periosteal reaction, joint space narrowing cysts, and in kids, epiphyseal enlargement. Um, there's a thing called Femister's triad, which is where you get juxtaparticular articular osteopenia, marginal erosions, and cartilage preservation. Interesting, it crosses the physis in about 30% of cases in kids. You can see that's the next stage showing some of the juxtaparticular osteopenia. Other investigations, uh, bone scanning is that very good one for in terms of us. ADH is 96% sensitive and MRI as well. However, MRI won't is not diagnostic. It's, not, it's um, just a, a screening test basically to assess a lesion and give you an idea as to whether or not it's a, um, whether or not it's active or not and uh, degree of fluid, etc. in it. Uh, but major differentials are tumors uh, in bone scan and MRI. Uh, in terms of treatment, so splinting is one of the ones which is commonly used in fact in, the, uh, in previous days prior to antibiotic therapy. So it's the classical thing was to splint them in an afterdesis or a functional position, given that they may progress onto uh, a union in an ankylosed joint. Um, these days, antibiotic therapy is the mainstay. A minimum of three drugs is used here. Uh, at least one's got bat bactericidal. The reason why three are used um, is basically to prevent the development of resistance, and in some cases four are used. A minimum of about three months duration of therapy, uh, 12 to 18 months with any sort of bone and joint involvement, and combination therapy with those medications there are the most uh, common regimes that are given. Uh, Interestingly, it is tailored for the region you're in and what localised resistance patterns uh, are available, which is normally done under the uh, guide of ID. Uh, in terms of resistance in osteoarticular disease, interestingly, there is a high resistance rate uh, with any sort of single agent therapy, so maybe some of the drugs in here, resistance patterns. In terms of surgical indications, um, this is an acute infection, joint lavation, decompression, abscess drainage, curettage, um, and then derivement of any avascular tissue, chronic infection, sequestered derivement, sinus excision, osteotomies, amputations, arthrodesis, or possums. Possibilities then arthroplasty options post TB. The recommendations are at least one year disease free. And you do a stage procedure with a biopsy and derivement, and then three to 12 months of chemotherapy, and then you come back and do your operation and post operative chemotherapy after that. In terms of spinal management, um, there's only 5% of uh, uncomplicated cases of spinal TB which warrant operative intervention. The major indications are tissue for diagnosis, abscess requiring drainage, regressive neurology, instability or kyphosis causing respiratory compromise. Kyphosis is, is the most common uh, clinical presentation, uh, primarily affecting the thoracic spine. Um, often involves numerous levels and gives rise to a gibbous uh, Thoracic spine was a picture of it earlier. Um, interestingly, the studies out of Hong Kong, um, which basically put forward the idea of uh, what, what became known as the Hong Kong procedure, which is anterior decompression and strut grafting, because the um, the area of the spine that's primarily involved is the anterior column, so they advocated going anteriorly, and the strut grafting support the uh, anterior column, and that prevent uh, that. Uh, Technique allowed for there to be less kyphosis in the long term than with going posterior or pure um, decompression alone. Um, in terms of correcting deformity, it's a very high risk 
in these uh, patient populations. Uh, so with children with significant amounts of kyphosis, to try and actually get them back out to a normal spinal alignment is very, very diff difficult from a neurological perspective, given that often there's chronic changes and there'll be relative lengthening of all the nerve levels involved, so it's a high risk of actually nitrogenic injury. So you're better off just fixing them in situ. Um, in terms of uh, actual spinal cord injury, um, early onset paraplegia is defined as that within two years, then there's later onset para, uh, paraplegia. And the acute onset or early onset is due to really that acute inflammatory reaction around the cord. And then the later onset uh, paraplegia is uh, due, to the, due to mechanical problems, sequestra, and then canal stenosis. Um, and some of the some of the prognostic factors are given there. So in terms of immunisation, which is important for us as we're looking at these, looking after these uh, patients, there's the tuberculin or MAN2 test, which we discussed before, which is a protein fraction of TB. Um, positive test only shows that you've been previously exposed to TB, uh, and it's basically a delayed hypersensitivity reaction. You read it after two days, it's positive, it's greater than this is the one where they just dig a little bit of it under your skin and they go back, you have to go back a day later and read it. Then there's the BCG vaccine. Um, this doesn't eliminate the chance of infection. Um, it's only about 50% protected. And the main reason for doing it is that um, you get a less severe form of the disease. Uh, its use is questionable, however, given that we are all exposed potentially to the cases of TB, it is advisable. It's the best thing we have at the moment in terms of the vaccine. Uh, however, only confers about 70 to 80 percent uh, actual um, you know, actual protection from the disease as such. It does invalid invalidate a MAN2 test and prevents early detection of disease. However, uh, with the new quantifurin gold test, you know, it's uh, it still is a it is still is a recommended um, preventive measure. So take-home points um, to be aware of are the increasing resistance patterns. Uh, as shown in those diagrams earlier, have a higher index of suspicion from any patients from a low, uh, from an endemic area or HIV positive. When we're sending tissue in the theatre, if we're not sure what it is, make sure you write on it delayed cultures and atypical organisms, otherwise, labs don't look for it. Uh, it's difficult to eradicate and it's very difficult to treat, so always involve ID early and um, be aware of any. Potential and be aware that you know, it takes a long, very long course of antibiotic therapy to actually try and eradicate it. And eradication in itself is very difficult to mm -hmm. obtain. Okay, that's it. Okay.